Hello, my name is Homer Knox and I'm with MenTeachingMen.com. I'm at the Life Center tonight in Bradenton, Florida. The Life Center is a Christian residential discipleship program and I'm always glad to be working with the men in this program. I'm going to be teaching in this video on the Gospel of Mark chapter 7. Uh, lesson outlines are on the MenTeachingMen.com website and you're certainly welcome to get them and, and download them for God's glory. I'm going to be using the New American Standard Bible for our scripture translations tonight. Mark is, a, is an action gospel. The, the gospel of Mark, it's an action gospel. It's Jesus, God's servant, doing God's will. Jesus was a man of action. He's always on the go, always doing things. And let's, let's review of chapter 6 on, on the Gospel of Mark. Jesus and his disciples are now on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Herod captures and executes John the Baptist, and Jesus feeds the 5,000. And that's the summary of chapter 6. All right. And so we, in chapter 7 here, we need to talk about four groups of people. We need to talk about the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they rose to defend the Jewish way of life. They were legalists. They were legalists. They believed in the Old Testament, and they were nationalists. They believed in, the, in Israel. And Jesus was a threat to them. He was a threat to them. And what do you do with a threat? You eliminate it, don't you? And that's what's going to happen here. The next group is the Sadducees. There's the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And the Sadducees were wealthy. They were socially minded. They wanted to get rid of tradition. They weren't spiritual. They were anti-spiritual. An example of that is in Mark 22, 23. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Uh, and they were opposed to the Pharisee, an opposing party. Next is the Herodians, and the Herodians were a political party, and their purpose was to keep Herod on the throne. And their power, the power of the government at that time, was through Rome. And so they worked to try to keep the Herods going. And finally, we have the scribes. Uh, they were professional expounders of the law. They got to be hair splitters. They were more concerned about the letter of the law than the spirit of the law. The in Mark 7, 1, I'm going to read reading here, and the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered together around Jesus when they had come from Jerusalem. Jesus was becoming famous. He was being known all over the place, and they wanted to check him out or spy him out in Galilee. And so they came to try to capture him in word and deed, to find fault. And there's confrontation coming from, from his en Jesus' enemies, and these are going to be it. And, you know, there's no middle ground with Jesus. You either trust Jesus or reject him, one or the other. And then in verse 2, and had seen some of the, and they had seen, the Pharisees had seen some of the disciples were eating with bread with impure hands. That is unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they came, when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and copper pots. They observe traditions of cleanliness, and some of those were excellent, and some of those were just ritualistic. Tradition in the book of Mark is mentioned five times, the word tradition. And like any other traditions, there's good and bad traditions, aren't there? Good and bad. Uh, the washing of hands, they have a ceremonial book. It's 65 pages of just how to wash your hands. Way complicated, way complicated. I'm thankful for traditions in our church. We have uh, traditions of baptism, we do feet washing, we do communion, we do baby dedication. There are many other traditions which are wonderful in a Christian church. Let's talk about accusations. The Pharisees are there and they're going to accuse now. And Jesus knew that the Pharisees were there, didn't he? He knew it. He didn't go tell his disciples right away, now watch out. Come on now, wash up you guys. And he didn't do that. Uh, he didn't do that. The disciples were all Jews and they knew the Pharisee was there too, didn't they? But they didn't change. And w why is that? Because they've rejected that tradition. Uh, but Jesus is going to use it here as an opportunity to teach. And in verse 5, And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, asked Jesus, 
Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? Uh, they're not accusing Jesus here, are they? They're accusing the disciples. Well, why didn't they accuse Jesus? Because they got tired of being humiliated by Jesus. When they'd accuse him, he'd humiliate them. And they had enough of that. And, but he, Jesus is going to answer. He's going to do the same with this question on the disciples. In verse uh, 6, he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but the heart is far from me. Hypocrite. Do you know what a hypocrite is? Uh, one thing about Jesus is he called it the way it is. He didn't play around. Okay, He didn't mince words. And that's what we see here. A hypocrite is an actor. It's somebody that's a stage player. Stage player. They're just acting through. Uh, and the heart condition is everything to God. He knows your heart. He knows your heart. And if your heart is not right, but you're willing, God can change your heart. And he makes changes on it when you first get saved. There's changes made. But other things have to be changed too. Church, our church, is a heart activity. It's not just a ritual. And what you want to do is purpose in your heart as you attend church to really worship the God with heart activity and cry out to him. Cry out to him. Don't make church a tradition. Now we do make it a tradition that we go every week. It's a standard in our life. But the worshiping part, you can be out of it too, right? You can be out of it too. Verse 7, But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Worship in vain. Worship in vain. It's like worshiping an idol, isn't it? Worship in vain. Nothing happens. Right? Doctrine. You know what doctrine is. Doctrine is a set of beliefs that's held and taught. Our church has doctrine. We teach doctrine. And we have to be careful that we teach the correct doctrine. And part of the deal with this is there's a responsibility with teaching. In James 3.1 it says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we shall incur stricter judgment. I'm talking about teachers there. Now here's what I tell God. I didn't volunteer for this. They called me and asked me to teach. Not I'm calling them on the phone. Peace, Pastor Ruth, let me teach. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. They asked me. And many church denominations have moved from the Word of God to man's traditions. Man's traditions. And that's one of the reasons you should consider bringing your Bible to church. Hey, is that right? Let's just look that up right now. You know, you never know. We're good at our church, but those other churches I've been to, I want to carry a Bible with me. So I'm not sure where they're going. Verse 8, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to, to, to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you nicely set aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Jesus is the righteous judge and he's going to judge here with an example. Now, verse 10, for Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. That's pretty strong stuff, isn't it? That's pretty strong stuff. In verse 11, But you say, and you substitute by tradition, if a man says to his father or mother, anything of mine you might have been helped by is Corban, that is to say, given to God, and you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as this. Well, this is, this is not just one example. This is an ouch, isn't it? Many things like this. Uh, okay, guy, here's the, here's the example. Question. Were they really going to give the support to God? Here's what you do. Your parents were needed. There wasn't Social Security back then, was there? Parents are aged. You took care of your parents. And where I come from in Lancaster, they had the Amish there. And that's the deal. They built a little home off their home to take care of their elderly families. There's no Social Security in that community. And so the question is, these people said, I'm going to give it to God, but they really are they really going to do that? Yeah. That's a good question, yeah. Corban, it means a gift or offering consecrated to God and that word's only used once in the New Testament. This is it. All right, questions. Any questions on so far? You all right? Verse 14. 
and he called the multitude to him again, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside the man which going into him can defile him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, the first thing he's doing, he's pronouncing all food clean. He's going to talk about that in a little bit. There's a listing in food that you can eat in Leviticus chapter 11. The whole chapter is, you can eat this, you can't eat that. And here's what it says in uh, chapter 11, verse 12. Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, These are the creatures which you may eat from all the animals that are on the earth. The regulations of food were good at that time, but that time passed. And so and those commandments are good, but they don't, they, Jesus and his disciples did not hold to them. A lot of people hold to them now. A lot of Jews hold to them now. Verse 17, and when leaving the multitude, he entered the house. His disciples questioned him about the parable. Well, a parable is something that's hidden. This isn't really a parable, although that's what it says. And Jesus gives further clarification. And he said to them, in verse 18, Are you so lacking in understanding also? And do you not understand that this is to his disciples? And do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. Dealing with the disciples, that's kind of an ouch there for them, isn't it? What does he say here? Are you so lacking also? Verse 20, and he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart, possess the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adultery, deeds of coveting, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. What a list. What a list. You know, make out a checklist for yourself. Do you have any of these things? Okay, make a checklist for yourself. Do you have any evil thoughts? Are you a fornicator with somebody? Have you stolen? Do you steal at work? Do you steal time at work? Are you a murderer in your heart? You know, have you committed adultery? Are you covet? Do you have wickedness in you? Deceit? All them. All these things proceed from within and defile the man. I had a wonderful man of God, and he told us his story. And what he said was, he's sitting there in the back of the church, you're watching, and there's some little cutie go down with her little strut. And he had this, he had this thought, you know, here it is, popped in. He said, man, I confessed it right away. I told the Lord I'm sorry. Bang, then I moved on. We all have that, don't we? We all have that. Ask forgiveness, make amends if you need to. Rebuke your actions. And just rebuke that thought. Put it out of your mind. Uh, it's an evil list. Before I got saved and after a period, a lot of these things I kept doing. I kept doing. And if you want to get your stuff, you want to get that stuff out of you, you have to give your, your soul, your heart. You ask God to change your, change your soul, change your heart. The soul is what? Three things. What is the soul? Mind, will, and emotions. You got one. Good. The soul is the mind, will, and emotions. And the Holy Spirit is able, is willing and able to change these things in you. You're a new creature with the new birth. And He wants you to move out from those things. Verse 24. And from there He arose and went away to the region of Tyre. Tyre was a city on a Mediterranean Sea. It was north of Israel. And there's, there's two parts to the city. There's a part, it's right on the ocean. It's the land part. And there's also an island part, 700 yards out. And what would happen, we'd have invaders come through there and they'd want to capture Tyre. And what they'd do, all the people from the city on the land would move out to the island. And then they couldn't get them. Well, finally what happened to Tyre is Alexander the Great came along and he captured the city and then they said, well, what are we going to do? And what he did was he had them destroy the city, take all the blocks and build a causeway out to the island. Huh. And that's how he defeated them. Threw rocks in the ocean, creating a passage. Uh, Tyre was a great trading city known for purple cloth. And when he had entered the house, he wanted no one to know of it. Yet he could not escape notice. I guess not, huh? 
people would be on here everywhere he went. He was doing miracles, and people wanted that, and so he couldn't escape notice. Righteous living, our righteous living will not escape notice by others. Faithfulness, if you're faithful in this ministry, you'll not escape notice. Hard work will not escape. Changes in your relationship with Jesus, either drawing near or moving away, will not escape notice. Is that true? You believe that? Verse 25. And after hearing him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, Let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. The woman was a Greek. She was a Greek. In Matthew 15, 24, it says, But Jesus answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now talk about focus. That was a focus, isn't it? Only to the lost sheep. Only to the lost sheep. Now, here's the question. Who's going to preach the gospel to the rest of the world? We are. The disciples were, aren't they? They were assigned to do that, and so are we. All right. Verse 28. But she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs on the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, and Jesus said to her, Because of this answer, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child laying on the bed, the demon having departed. Verse 31. And again he went away out of the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee with the region of Decapolis. And they brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty and entreated him to lay his hand upon him. Decapolis is a group of ten cities. And that's what that means. No sickness is too difficult for Jesus. I don't care what you have or what we're going to have. No sickness is too difficult. We're on verse 33. We're in Mark chapter 7. And he took him aside from the multitude, this is the deaf and dumb man, and put his fingers in his ears, and after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva. Oh, you know, there's a big work here. Put his finger in his ear, spitting, touching his tongue, you got saliva. All those are aids to increasing this man's faith. It's in faith increase. He could just say, boom, and it's done. But it's, it's moving in faith in this guy. And looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said to him, be open. And his ears were open, and the pediment of his speech were removed. And he began speaking plainly. And Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone. But the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. And they were utterly astonished, saying, He has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. While we're at the end of this chapter, Jesus does all things well, doesn't he? He does all things well. He did well back then, and he does it today. All things well. Thank you, Jesus. Well, let's do a summary of chapter 7. Uh, again, Mark is an action gospel. We see Jesus in a lot of action here. And the first thing we see, he rebukes the Pharisee. It's ongoing. It's ongoing. He heals the daughter with the unclean spirit, and he heals the deaf man and the dumb man. It's wonderful, wonderful that Jesus deals with the masses. He deals with thousands and thousands, but he has a personal interest in each one of us, as he did for the deaf man and for the sick girl. You know, our God cares for us. He's a loving Father. And each of you and each of me and each of us, how's that? And each of us are important to Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hello, friends. This is Homer Knox again. I hope you enjoyed this video teaching. The question I have for you is, is your name written in the book of life? Are you born again? And are your sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ? Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He suffered and died under Pontius Pilate and the Romans. He was buried for three days and three nights. And he rose from the dead in power. And he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, according to the scriptures. There is salvation in no one else. If you have not done so, now, now is the time to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Or if you have walked away from this salvation and want to have your name rewritten in the book of life, please pray with me. 
Dear Jesus, I accept you as my personal Savior. Come into my heart. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I ask you to cleanse me with your precious blood. Thank you for giving me this salvation. Thank you for making me a new person. And thank you for the Holy Spirit now living inside of me. Amen and amen. If you prayed this prayer from your heart for the first time, you're now born again, you're saved, you're part of the Christian family. Praise God. Welcome. Welcome. If you prayed this prayer after slipping away, congratulations. You're back in the kingdom. You're back in the fold. There's another teaching on the menteachingmen.com website entitled, I Just Got Saved, Now What? And that video will help you on your new walk with Jesus Christ. Also, there are other videos on the Men Teaching Men website which would help you in your daily walk. God bless you.